Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, when we sent out the flyer, we were very happily going to have Julia McCrossan here as your Q&A facilitator. Now you've got me, Alan Shell. So I'm going to do my best. Um, unfortunately, Julie has come down with a bad flu and, as we should all say in medicine, stay home, be healthy and get better. So we wish uh, Julie a speedy recovery. This evening we have a very tough topic to talk about, but as always, uh, there is hope on the horizon as well as a lot of support in the community. So if you notice on your seats, there's a very, very good flyer there which provides you with the number of services that we do have available today in our community. And with that, we have a number of very special guests, speakers and members of the audience, as well as our own Claire Vernon from Jewish Care, who is a community supporter and partner of the Walper Jewish Hospital. So with that in mind, before I introduce our panel and guest speakers tonight, I'm going to introduce you to Claire Vernon to talk about a very special program called the Jewish Suicide Prevention Strategy. Uh, Claire is well known to our community and to the wider community as the CEO of Jewish Care. And uh, she started her career as a social worker, then with hands-on experience and more became involved in developing some of the strategies for our state's health policies and improved outcomes in such diverse areas as women's health, violence against women and helping victims of crime. So as our partner tonight, I'd like you to welcome Claire Vernon. Thank you. Hi and welcome. Um, in 2017, uh, we at Jewish Care realised we were seeing an increasing number of families in the Jewish community who were grieving the loss of a loved one who had died by suicide and the unimaginable pain and forever unanswered questions. Many of you here tonight would know or have been touched by the deaths that are occurring in our community. We knew we had to do something. We knew we had to save lives. And while, as you'll hear tonight from the panel, prevention is hard, one thing we know the Jewish community has is a strong sense of community to build upon. So we invited 20 community organisations to join us in establishing the Jewish Suicide Prevention Strategy, the first in Australia. We were fortunate to have Isabel Shapiro, a well-known and respected community leader who's here tonight, to chair the strategy meetings. Um, somebody remarked to me that it must be a bit like chairing the UN with those Jewish organisations around the table but the goodwill and commitment of the organisations is what shines through. We then drew upon the expertise of uh, mainstream community around suicide prevention and drew upon the, uh, based our strategy on the Black Dog Integrated and Best Practice Lifespan Framework. And we know that the membership and our, the expertise of the Suicide Prevention Australia, who are also here tonight, will keep us informed about best practice. Because as you will hear, suicide prevention is an Australian-wide and worldwide challenge. Since our launch in 2018, we've achieved a lot. One of our proudest achievements is using funding from the Walper Hospital Foundation, thank you, and the Jewish Communal Appeal. We've trained over 300 community members in mental health first aid training. And we've developed a range of resources, some of which are here tonight, including a crisis card. Getting the community talking about mental health about suicide prevention and how to save lives is why events like tonight are so important and I thank you all for coming out. 
Year two, our priority is to put in place intensive support to people who have attempted to end their life by suicide because research tells us that that's a critical group to be intervening and supporting. And we are doing this by building on our relationships with hospitals and community services. So welcome to this very important event. And if at the end of the night, you'd like to find out more about the Jewish suicide prevention strategy, or even think about signing up for our free mental health first aid training, I would encourage you to see me or some of the staff at Jewish Care who are here tonight. Thanks. Thank you, Claire. If you look up Black Dog uh, Institute, you'll see that from the Australian Bureau of Statistics, about 65,000 people have made a suicide attempt. That's from hospital admissions alone, so the number's much larger than that. More than 3,000 Australians have died by suicide in 2017. And suicide is the leading cause of death in young Australians between the age of 15 and 44. Looking at the audience, we're a bit older than that, but uh, thank you just to understand that young Australians are more likely to take their own life than in motor vehicle accidents today. So we've reduced the number of motor vehicles through seat belts and drive safety, drive aware programs, but sadly suicide is still a serious cause of death. And in 2017 for the stats, about 75% of people who died by suicide were males, obviously 25% were female. And amongst the Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander numbers, that's certainly a larger statistic. Uh, what can we do? It's a complex disease. Factors such as stressful life events, trauma, illness, physical illness, drug abuse, amongst others. And what are some of the things we can do? We need to provide support, and thankfully we have a number of support services compared to when I started my medicine career over 40 years ago. There's improving that person's sense of worth and uh, purpose and seeking help. So tonight we're going to introduce you to some very good people who are part of that help, research and in some ways innovation. We have Alan Woodward, please come up, join us. We have John Brogdon. We have Michael Dudley. And certainly last but not least, we have Fiona Shand. So please welcome our panel tonight. Now, as is usual in a Q&A, there's some questions to be asked and there are some answers to be given. So each of the people on our panel certainly have different aspects of the prevention as well as the life story around suicide. And I have posed a couple of questions for them, but we'll certainly at least introduce each one, if I don't mind, and maybe Fiona could go first. Now, Fiona's... a clinical psychologist and researcher involved in the Black Dog Institute and the National Health and Medical Research Council. Is that right? Yep. Yeah, apart from other things. Um, and certain for research excellence in suicide prevention and currently is working with Lifespan. So let's uh, talk a little bit about Lifespan. What does Lifespan do? Up close, because you've got to eat this microphone yep, like an sure. ice cream. So, so Claire mentioned before that um, the Jewish community is using the Lifespan framework. And Lifespan is really about um, working across different sectors to bring people together to make sure that we create a community safety net for people who might be at risk. Um, and we work with people to try and prevent um, people getting to that point of suicidality in the first place. So that's through working with young people in schools, for example, helping, helping them to um, become more resilient, know how to support their peers and so on, uh, through to uh, using mind frame guidelines to make sure that media are reporting safely and responsibly around suicide, 
through to uh, working with um, uh, the health sector to make sure that uh, people who have mental illness or suicidality are identified and well cared for, and as Claire mentioned, providing care for people if they have actually experienced a suicidal crisis. So it is a bit about also making sure the community is, uh, is well equipped to identify if someone is distressed and to ask them the right kinds of questions and get them to perhaps seek help, um, but also to make sure that that help is there so the health system is responding in the right way. So it's really working across multiple sectors to make sure that all of those sectors are working together to support people. Okay. Now, this wonderful system that we now all own and use has also created an app around improving Aboriginal health outcomes. So could you talk a little bit about that? And are we going to see that as a, perhaps a broader application for the rest of the community? Yeah, so, um, so we, we term the use of apps and online services as e-mental health broadly. And the app that we developed was specific for young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who might be having thoughts of suicide. And what we know is that um, young people, and in particular young Aboriginal people, are less likely to seek help if they are distressed. So the idea of an app is it allows people to get a little bit of help without actually having to go and talk to someone in the first instance. And what we're testing is whether it actually also leads them to seek more help if they need it. Um, but there are a number of um, online programs for treating depression and anxiety based on cognitive behavioural therapy. And the research shows that those programs are as effective as going to see someone face to face. Um, so they're a, a, a reasonable option for people who either can't access standard services or for whatever reason are not ready to seek that kind of help yet. Okay, thank you. Now, I do apologise that we did not acknowledge the first people of this country that we live and work in uh, and their elders past, present and future. So thank you for the reminder. Um, now I introduce you to Michael Dudley, uh, a psychiatrist, been involved in certainly mental health amongst adolescents and youth and uh, in health prevention uh, and also I guess, teaching of medical students at University of New South Wales. So tell us a bit about yourself and what you do. Up um, close. Yeah, thanks, Alan. Um, so um, I've been involved in working with young people for about 30 years um, in the area of suicide prevention and um, I'm a former chair of Suicide Prevention Australia um, and I've had a lifetime interest in this area, basically. So as we talked about before, that's only sort of the 1990s that we started that. Yeah. So prior to that, we didn't have much to work no, with, did we? it started in 1992 or thereabouts, yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay, thank so, you for yeah. that. No, we'll come back uh, in a moment to John Brogdon, a politician well known to us all and a very generous person with his time. So thank you for coming along this evening. And in fact, uh, oh, thank you. The last time we met was some years ago and we talked about that we had an article on depression and John certainly told us some truths about his own sort of travails through life and politics. So let's hear a bit about what you've been doing and also who you support in the community. Thank you, Alan. Firstly, I'm not a politician, I'm a recovering politician. <laughs> I'm in hope of full recovery one day. Um, so, the Liberal uh, Party, though. <laughs> so thanks um, for the chance to be here and thank you to Wapa for the invitation. Uh, my, uh, I guess I come with two hats on. The first one is I'm the chairman of Lifeline in Australia, an organisation that's been at the front line of suicide prevention since 1963 uh, and over the telephone. And when you consider that uh, back in 1963, not every house had a telephone and suicide, in fact, uh, um, attempting to commit suicide was a criminal act in New South Wales, believe it or not. So to think back in 1963 that people had the foresight to create an organisation like Lifeline was, I think, quite remarkable. So we have um, 40 centres around the country and we take a little under 900,000 telephone calls a year, but we add on to that the other contacts we take online and face-to-face. -face. And interestingly now, we're trialling a text service for suicide prevention, um, which in very simple terms is doing what we've done for 50, 55 years, but doing it through text. Um, and the research we've done to date indicates that uh, it's obviously attractive to younger people who probably text more than they talk. And it's also, the research indicates that uh, there are uh, the major 60 to 70% of the people who are taking part in the trial uh, are um, people who would not have called our number, but they'll only text our number. 
And I guess the other reason I'm here is um, uh, when I was in politics uh, nearly 14 years ago, I left politics after a suicide attempt, which was very high profile. So I have depression, I live with my depression, and I have suicidal ideation, which I live with as well. Um, and uh, that's been my life for the last 14 years. It's probably, frankly, been my life for the 10 years prior to that, but not properly recognised and certainly not treated. So that's part of my life now, and I guess I've made um, one of my post-political objectives uh, is that we think about and we talk about and we feel about, feel in our hearts about uh, mental health in the same way we think about and we talk about physical health, and I think that's a great objective. Thank you. And we have Alan Woodward, who's a strategic advisor for Quality Innovation and Suicide Prevention Australia. Um, he's certainly a good friend of all the people here on the panel, I understand. Come all the way from Kiama, so thank you very much for coming here tonight. Um, he's also part of New South Wales Mental Health Community Advisory Committee. Uh, he's done a lot of things over the last uh, many years. And the International Association of Suicide Prevention Helpline Special Interest Group. Please tell us a little bit, if I can say any more than that, about you <laughs> up close. And what do you think are some of the things that have changed over the last 20 years, perhaps for the positive or the negative? Uh, th thank you, and thank you for the, uh, the welcome this evening. So, yes, yeah, so I've worked in the field of suicide prevention for about 20 years, and uh, I, I come at uh, the topic in terms of policy and program and services rather than um, a clinical or a health or um, academic perspective. Can I ask why you decided to do this out there sort of topic? You know, it's um, it's not so much that it was a conscious decision, but I think uh, I've been working in areas of social policy and human services, and what I found was that my work took me into this area, which I think is reflective of the emerging community uh, response to suicide in Australia. So I think I was like many people, um, and Michael alluded to it back in the early 90s, the issue was very much kept hidden and there were very few services or supports available and not much attention and, and certainly even um, over 10 years ago to try and talk with governments about suicide prevention was a very difficult thing. So I think one of the things I've seen is a dramatic change in the willingness of people to recognise the issue um, and also we have seen the growth of services and supports and we continue. So Suicide Prevention Australia, which is the, the organisation that I'm providing advice to presently, um, is a member association of more than 100 organisations that provide services and they're all different types. You know, some of them are very local community based, some of them are large services serving the whole country, some are, are health based, some are social service based. Okay, so I did have a chance to speak with Julie uh, before today and came up with some questions that we felt would be valid. And I think uh, from my experience, and, and we all agreed that this topic, the word of suicide, is a taboo out there for many of us who have particular religion, Judeo-Christian in particular. And I do remember in, in the past when you were asked to sign a death certificate, make sure they were Catholic, that you didn't put suicide because then they'd be plotted over there in disgrace. So I think that in some ways the taboo around suicide has sort of changed. I've come to Fiona in your sort of research. Have you come up against that sort of issue as well? Yeah, so, um, yes, yeah, certainly we know that stigma is um, a, a, a problem not just for people who think that others will judge them, but they judge themselves as well. So, um, and what, we, what we've also found in our research is that the more people feel that suicide is stigmatised, the less likely they are to seek help uh, if they're in crisis. So it is a real barrier. And, you know, I think uh, I echo John's sentiments before that it would be um, really wonderful if we could get to a point where suicidality and mental illness were viewed in the same frame as physical illnesses and physical disorders were. Thank you. And to Michael, on the collegial, the doctor side, oh, well, some look, of the things we talked about as well. What, yeah, you're on, you've got to be up close. Sorry. Um, so we talked about cultural barriers. And yes. In fact, one of the cultural barriers is amongst medicos. Would you agree? And totally, also our yeah, training. Correct. I, I absolutely agree with what Fiona said. And um, I would want to say that I think, um, you know, sort of historically... Um, and even contemporaneously, people approach coming into ED departments don't always get a good 
um, service, and they actually report that. Um, and you know, I think um, Diego De Leo certainly, who's a leading Australian suicidologist, found this 15 years ago with some very good data on that. And I think there's been subsequent data pointing to that as well. Certainly, my um, anecdotal experience points to that. I think health professionals are not convinced that suicide prevention is possible sometimes. Or so there's a, so there is a minority, a significant minority, who who may not be convinced that that's the case. And that's a matter of, to do with education, and it's a matter to do with confidence and a sense of competence in in the workplace knowing what to do when someone presents with that with with, with this kind of problem so when and seeing it as being a genuine problem that needs to be addressed not a, bo a bogus problem so when they're brought into emergency having been found at home there's a process that is diverse across australia unfortunately we don't have a standard of management do we no, we don't. We don't necessarily have a standard of management across uh, emergency departments in the way that this is taken up. And and Fiona is absolutely correct that there are certain groups of people who typically stay away from services um, because they're you know it may well be because for a number of reasons, but certainly some have been burnt by the system. People have been in psychiatric hospitals before, for example, and haven't been treated well. Um, people who suicide bereaved. Um, you know, there's a whole lot of groups young men, um, I could go on. Okay, so maybe to John, if you look at some issues around Lifeline, how do they perhaps move those people on having had how many thousands a year? Yeah, sure, nearly a million. So, so I, if I might just add to that last question first, I, I um, had a suicide attempt um, nearly 14 years ago and uh, that was, you know, involved self-harm and all, you know, a genuine attempt to take my own life and so I thank God every day that I'm here um, and uh, um, I got good care, you know, it was high profile, so the police and ambulance, all that sort of stuff. Uh, I got unwell about two years ago and at one stage presented myself at our local hospital and they took me straight through, which was good, They rather than literally waiting in the waiting room. And they put me in bed and I had um, a very young doctor pat me on the shoulder and tell me, it'll be all right, it'll be all right. I felt like saying I don't have the flu. Um, and uh, they let me out the next day, and I've and my wife will tell you we've been waiting every day since for a follow up. So that still remains that those figures there were there was on that second that second slide it said the greatest the greatest indicator of a, a suicide is a is a previous attempted suicide. It's really that simple actually. It's it is the greatest single indicator. So not following people up is, I mean, we had three children. My wife had three children in that same hospital. Um, the nurses turned up for the week afterward, did all that wonderful follow-up. We let suicidal people walk out of hospital, by and large. And there is an horrific correlation between, you know, uh, hospitals that are near railway lines and all those horrific things you never want to think about. It's all real and it all happens. So from a lifeline perspective, we're, we're like, I can never work out whether we're the um, paramedics at the bottom of the cliff or the top of the cliff. But think of us as paramedics. We don't do surgery. We get you through that moment. So what we try and do is have safety plans for people. But on t 10 to 15 occasions every day, our people on the phone will make an assessment that the other person, the person they're talking to, is at such a high risk of suicide that we'll keep them on the line and call the police and ambulance Which to John go to where Moore's they are. did many years ago on 2GB. Right, yeah. Um, so we do that 10 or 15 times a day. And uh, if there are firearms involved, the police will literally kick the door down. Literally kick the door down. So... That's real life and death for us, and then we try and do the care plans. Part of the challenge we have, and I, please don't be discouraged genuinely from calling Lifeline, but one of the challenges we have is we're anonymous, so we don't trace people. Part of the reason people call us is they're calling an anonymous person. Why is that important when you're feeling suicidal? You don't want to tell a friend, maybe. You may have stolen money from the business. You may have cheated on your wife. Who knows what you've done, but you don't want to talk to a friend sometimes. You want to talk to somebody who's anonymous. So it makes it hard for us to track people and track data as a consequence. That's one of the downsides. But, um, you know, uh, we get people, you know, I'm amazed the number of people we get often years and years and years later who will say, stop you in the street or something and say, oh, you no, know, 20 years ago Lifeline saved my life. Um, but we, what we're finding, interestingly, against an increase of suicide by, of 9% in the last period that the ABS measured, a 9% increase. So, correct me if I'm wrong, Medicos, every other... Every other illness, the ABS, Australian Bureau of Stats, collects. It's a dreary piece of work called Causes of Death in Australia. 
Every other cause of death dropped except lifestyle diseases like diabetes and the like that went up and suicide went up 9%. 9%. Unheard of. We've never seen a number like that. And uh, um, we're not getting more calls, but we're getting more intense calls. We're getting more people who are quite intense um, and getting to us in a very distraught state. Okay, thank you. So, to Alan, if we look at strategies and, and if you look at – and we come to the movies here and there's a – something to do with death or then they have a little byline afterwards, contact lifeline, and this upset you or cause any distress? And maybe some people in the audience would also find talking about it distressful. Do you think that's a good strategy? Does that help prevent suicide? Is that something that you've been part of or can enlighten us on well, up close? Yes, yes. And it is something I've been part of. I worked for Lifeline for 14 years and uh, and uh, have uh, continued to always. And it's closer, please. So I do... I do think there is a very significant value in making the offer of help and support and making it in as many ways as possible and as many times as possible because uh, what you're doing there are are really two key things. The first is is almost a symbolic gesture in making the offer of help. The person says, oh, there are some other people in the world who care for me. Um, And the second thing that you're doing is you're providing a practical means for assistance. Uh, and as John says, there are some times that you really don't want to talk to your family or friend about something. That's often the case for people who are contacting Lifeline or other services. Um, and uh, you know, to facilitate different ways of seeking help. I mean, another way is, frankly, building the capacity of people who are friends and family members of others, all of us in the community, um, to be alert and to, to make the offer of help. I mean, one of the uh, programs in Australia, Are You OK?, has had a massive impact you know, with uh, you know, three quarters of Australians are aware of the Are You OK campaign. Um, you know, I'll, I'll share with you an, an interesting little, um, I, I guess, uh, uh, illustration of, of how that campaign can cut through and change things. This, um, my, my dear mother, who's 90 years of age, has for most of the last 20 or 30 years wondered what on earth her son does for work, you know, and occasionally I try and explain and, and so on. She's a very smart woman, but, you know, perhaps I'm a little bit too esoteric, esoteric sometimes. I said uh, recently that I was, I was uh, doing some uh, work with the Are You OK people and straight away she knew what Are You OK was. Well, she said, that's a very good program. I'm very proud that you're doing that work. <laughs> and, um, and uh, you know, she was saying, yeah, we talk about that with my friends. Now, I think that ability to change the way in which Australian society reinforces the basic sense that it's, it is okay to ask each other how we're, how we're tracking. It is good to have positive conversations with each other and it normalises the notion that we as a society will care and look out for each other. That is a really important part of suicide prevention. Okay, so with that in mind, we're going to invite a couple of nice, very nice young ladies from the audience here. First one is going to be Sarah Bartlett. If you'd mind standing up here, please, with me. Come on, so Sarah, Sarah works with Every Mind, which uh, came out of the Hunter Institute Mental Health Program. Yeah, formerly. Uh, as a project lead for the suicide prevention team. You've got to get closer to me. Come on. Sorry. That's, right. That's, That's all right. All right. Oh, we'll go <laughs> over the side here. Is OK? There you go. Yeah. OK. And uh, has been involved in a number of projects, including development of Framework 4, Promotion of Mental Health and Wellbeing, uh, particularly amongst child and youth mental health. So what would you like to tell us about that up close? Uh, I'd like to actually say that I'm actually leading a a program, Mindframe, that I think some of you in the audience have perhaps had some training with. Uh, It was up on on the slide earlier and um, the panel members have been talking about uh, those numbers that you see at the end of communication, media reports or in online stories, in the news. So Mindframe is really uh, trying to lead um, the way in which we talk safely about suicide and mental illness in Australia and across the world, I would say, um, through our guidelines. So we're working with media around Australia to really help break down the stigma associated with these issues and to help upskill um, all the agencies um, and community people that engage with media to be able to have safe conversations around suicide and mental illness. That includes um, giving people information around the complexity of suicide, 
having an understanding of warning signs and how to link people into support services and, and what those support services are. So you've got on your chairs a flyer with all of the helplines. So I would encourage you all to have a look at those services and they're, they're the, um, the supports available to anybody um, around Australia who may be, you know, having a um, difficult time. Um, so. Okay, and there's Alan and, and John, the issue around anonymity and privacy, how does that work? Sure, so um, what we know from, um, and I'm certainly not an expert researcher, um, we've got panellists up here, but we know that a lot of young people like the anonymity of going online. Um, and so when we're communicating about suicide or mental illness, we're encouraging people to provide not just telephone numbers, but also those websites where we know that young people like to, and even uh, you know people more generally like to be able to go online, have those really confidential conversations where they're not identified and able to um, have a conversation in a safe space. Thank you, Sarah. Say thank you, please. Okay, we're going to introduce young Stephanie. So come over this side so we can get another picture shot on this side. Okay, so Stephanie works with a very interesting group called Batir. Batir was an Asian elephant out of the Almaty Zoo in the former USSR, and he was claimed to be able to say a few meaningful human speech words. So Batir stands for giving a voice to the elephant in the room, and we talked about suicide as being this big elephant, and nobody wants to talk about it, but it's a problem we need to talk about. So tell us a bit about yourself, Steph. You come all the way from Canada. Yes, just for tonight, actually, <laughs> six years ago. But um, yeah, so Batir, it, it, we're all about giving a voice to the elephant in the room. So we run preventative education mental health programs for young people in schools, universities, um, and at workplaces as well. So as we were talking about, stigma is a leading barrier that prevents people from reaching out for support. And so we want young people to know that it's actually okay to not be okay and help us out there. So a big focus for us in how we give a voice to, the, to young people is we run a program called Being Heard, where we train young people between 18 to 30 years old to learn how to share their story of what they've been through with mental ill health, but focusing on how they were able to reach out for support. Because oftentimes in the media and in, you know, when we're talking about suicide, it's a very heavy topic. And so I think for us, it's really important that we're also talking about how you can actually reach out for support um, and, and share stories of hope and resilience to inspire others to reach out if they need it as well. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. So the big question, of course, is what if you know somebody close to you or at work, uh, in the office, somebody who's talked to you about suicide ideation um, and being suicidal? And now John's talked about his experience. How about over here with the young people, Michael? Well, it's amazing that they've actually told you, you know, uh, that's, that's the first thing. Um, and a lot of, a lot of people wouldn't. And um, it's striking that that's happened. And if it's the person telling you directly, then um, it's really important to indicate that you take it very seriously and um, ask the appropriate questions that, you know, would, would try and, you know, figure out what, what, was happening in terms of uh, around the suicidal thinking and planning, of course, and and actions, but also try and understand the story of the of the person. A, a, a big problem, obviously, is the societies. We're trying to keep things private. We wanted the neighbours to know. Unfortunately, people putting things up on Facebook and Instagram is an issue, and privacy disappears. So, if they've come to me as the GP, and I'm not trained, I may find it very difficult to manage that particular problem. In fact, I may even say, look, you're okay, why don't we think about some antidepressants and stop thinking that way, which is a common answer. Or I better refer you to a colleague of mine who's a psychiatrist, but hey, what, I can't get you in there for two weeks because he's equally busy. So what are some of the steps that lay people can consider as being resourceful? Okay, that's a really vital question. Um, so uh, the, the kind of options that you know, busy GPs would have in that situation are calling up the the statewide mental health line, um, speaking to the to the crisis team there, making a referral to the mental health service or the, the you know the young people's mental health service, um, and uh, you know, I guess um, 
potentially uh, not that uh, not that antidepressants wouldn't be suitable, but but making a referral to a, a depending on the degree of urgency uh, um, uh, to a clinical psychologist would also be an option. Um, but but certainly you'd want to if someone's telling you that you would. Uh, one would take it with the utmost gravity and one would be really concerned about identifying underlying treatable health conditions like depression, um, like an anxiety, um, other, other conditions that might drive that, traumatic conditions in origin, um, possibly psychosis. There's a range of other conditions and try to try to figure out if they're present and also figure out what supports the person has, the reasons for living and dying, other things. My okay, cool, so yes. What are you going to do? Well, I think, I think, I think, as I said, I think you probably, if you feel you've got the skills to support them, you might, you might delay and get them back. But if you don't feel that you do and you haven't got the time, then I think the options are to employ to get someone else in, engaged as soon as, as soon as is possible. That's correct. Along the lines that I've I've just said, and there's also. Um, many other, you know, as we just heard and seen on the screen, uh, many other kind of um, uh, uh, options in terms of emergency plans and so on. So working out a safety plan and working out um, how they're going to get to the next base and how they're going to be effectively followed is part of the deal as well. So to research in this sort of picture, there's a microphone there, sorry. What would you think in this sort of situation where people have been asking for help and, hey, it didn't happen. Have you looked at those sort of issues, particularly in Aboriginal health, for instance? Yeah, so um, so we actually did do some of that research around what happens to people when they present to the ED and they don't have good experience. Um, and uh, it was the only predictor of... If, if a person had a bad experience at that first point of contact, whether it was the um, the the ED or the paramedic or the police officer or whoever else happened to be, um, they, it made them less likely to reach out for help the next time. So we know that getting – and look, it doesn't have to be rocket science. It just needs to be kindness and compassion and empathy that people receive um, and to be listened to and to be taken seriously. Um, so, so that's – you know, that's, that's – a characteristic that we can all exhibit. It, that's not a special skill set that only doctors have or only psychologists have. So, you know, I think as health professionals, but also as family members and, you know, um, uh, uh, carers, that that just listening to someone and acknowledging their pain and not just reassuring that they're going to be okay as if they've got the flu um, is really important. And sometimes people just want their pain acknowledged. So, um, you know, that's a critical thing that, that all of us can do, I think. Okay, to John on Lifeline, if you looked at people have been f many thousands, have they looked at how many might be issues around suicide as a percentage? Not that we should yeah, use sure. that as so, a serious yeah, but no, an we, idea. W what's interesting is uh, we would say that Alan's, Alan left us last year at Lifeline, so he's got the numbers better than me most likely, but about 7% of our people on the phone identify suicidal at the beginning of a call. But through the call, we get to about a total of 30% who are suicidal, which means as you talk to them and they tell you what's happening and we ask the questions, they're actually not worried about being able to pay the, the 30% house. is 300,000 of the million? Yeah, yep, of the calls, not necessarily 300,000 ah, okay. people. We get some repeat calls. So uh, as you get through, you realise that what they're telling you about is not about the problem. We know that they're suicidal. But, you know, we I'd encourage, if you're sitting with someone you're worried about them, Ring up Lifeline, put them on the speaker and talk together. You know, talk them and, – and you're not the expert, right? We're not experts. Some people are, but I'm not an expert. But get the expert on the phone. It's Lifeline or what are the other call lines. Don't worry about that. But if you get them on there because they know the right questions to ask. And the hardest thing – and all of the professional advice and all of our research and, and anecdotal advice suggests that you have to be blunt in asking the question. What we're used to is, are you OK? I radio, you're OK. And you walk away thinking, no, they're not OK, but – I don't want to pry. I don't want to be too personal. You've got to actually be very blunt. You've got it's, you've got to be blunt and say, "Do you think you're going to kill yourself, or do you think you're going to hurt yourself?" That's an incredibly difficult thing to say. Um, every bone in my body tells me that's the thing I shouldn't be saying, but it's actually the thing you should be saying. And what it will do, almost like sucking poison out, they'll either say, "Oh no, look, no, 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 I'm not," but and they'll tell you what's going on, or they will tell you, and that's when you hold on to them the way, in my view. 
to go back to the analogy I used earlier, the way you'd hang on to somebody who's having a heart attack, you wouldn't talk, walk away from somebody having a heart attack. You'd hang on to them. So you hang on to that person, you ring the police, you ring the ambulance, you get onto a lifeline, you're taken to a hospital, but you just get them, and if, particularly if they're at that very high point of suicide, that high point of, of risk, which um, of course happens. You know, there are 3, 000, almost 3,200 Australians who take their own lives every year, and that's a figure that's growing. Um, and part of the quandary, and Alan spoke as he always does very eloquently to this, you know, in his 20 years we've seen more services and more policies and certainly more money. There's never enough money, but there's a lot more money that's been put into it. But suicide's going up. Every other medical condition you want to put money into, you want to see it go down. That's the reason you're putting money into it. You want to see it go down. Um, you know, we're seeing rates of things like breast cancer, relatively speaking, go down, which is fantastic. We've poured money into that in research and help. But we're doing, we're, we're pouring money in probably not enough, but not seeing it not seeing it go up rather than go down. Thank you. So to Alan, a man from rural New South Wales or rural <laughs> setting, so do you think that our... <laughs> yes. It's all right, and I've done lots of surveys amongst GPs in the city who can, in fact, I work in the dementia um, area, is that if you're, say, around here and you've got Prince of Wales, St Vincent's and others and St George to look after, what happens when you're down in Kiama or Shell Harbour? Wollongong's pretty good, but as we get a bit further out... Are we providing the services to assist somebody who's out of town in this way? What What are some of the strategies we've put in place or have we? Yeah, look, it's a really good, good question. And, um, yes, the further you get away from the large cities, sometimes uh, the more difficult it is to, to access some of the services, particularly more specialised services. Or have people um, who are there... I know that came off and had GPs helping run the hospital. Mm. So, in fact, some of your services are a bit stretched already, aren't they? Mm. Then you have somebody who has an issue around suicide. Um, are we helping them in sort of those sort of settings? Yeah, there's probably a couple of dimensions to that. I mean, we'd always like to have evenly spread services and sometimes that's just uh, not possible in a country as vast as Australia and the spread of the population. So, But one of the other things that's probably important to realise is that a lot of people um, uh, you know, experiencing suicidal crisis are actually not going to go to a health professional. Um, so where we've had a look at some of the data uh, um, through databases such as the Victorian Suicide Register, you know, as many as half of the people who died by suicide did not have any contact with a health professional in the period leading up. You know, half did, so there's, there's some case for equipping health professionals and having that system being responsive and appropriate. But so too are there other services that they might come into play with, you know, the family support service, the housing service, the employment service, um, possibly um, police or the, ju the justice system. And uh, it's important to have those services alert to where a person is showing that sign of distress or possibly even articulating their own suicidality. Moreover, uh, many people you know, experiencing suicidal crisis will indicate signals of their pain and, and distress to the people they trust around them. And, and that might listening. be their work colleagues, it might be their friends or family, it might be someone they're playing footy with. Uh, so one of the ways that we look at the question of what services are needed for suicide prevention is that we need to cover a lot of bases there. We need to equip the broad community with a level of receptiveness and support and we need to then create linkages into the services that can take a step further. Now, John's suggestion around, you know, get Lifeline on the phone and put it on the speaker um, functionality is a really good one um, because sometimes people run out of what they can offer within their own resources and certainly the solution is not to turn every person in Australia into a, you know, fully equipped counsellor. Um, but there are other linkages that can be formed as well, um, you know, linkages into other people that a person trusts and feels that they can confide in. The most important thing, and this is just building on what Fiona and, and, and Michael have said, is to take the person's distress seriously, not to dismiss or discount it, and show genuine compassion and, and, and help them connect. Uh, you know, the, um, the origins of some of the work around helplines back in the US in the 60s in Los Angeles with a group of psychiatrists who were running a, a, a clinical practice and providing a lot of uh, clinical treatment for people around their, their suicidal behaviours. Um, Ed Schneidman, Norm Fabro, Bob Littman. And those guys started to do uh, some work 
around supporting their, their patients after hours, including setting up a telephone helpline. And one of the things that they noticed was the inherent value of the person experiencing suicidal crisis to be able to talk and feel heard and uh, that that would you know, diminish the suicidal intensity but also provided a greater prospect for working through how you might help the person take some steps in addressing the issues. Now, Ed Snyderman, who is really one of the, the great uh, writers uh, around suicide prevention, coined the phrase psychic. He said, the thing to understand most critically about the suicidal person is that they are experiencing profound and deep pain. Now, he used the term psychic um, as a way to try and underpin that. And therefore, at the very heart of reaching out, suicide is about human suffering. And we reach out to people as human beings. And every person can do that. What you do after that initial step can change and different people can be involved. But we need human compassion. Thank you. OK, I think we should have a couple of questions from the audience. We've done enough talking. Uh, anybody who'd like to ask or pose a question? Uh, Cedric, down the middle here. Michelle or Ruth, you've got a f microphone there. Just a moment, Cedric. Cedric is a wonderful supporter of WALPA, helps us in many, on many occasions. Got to speak nice and loudly there. Watch out, Ruth, don't fall over. Up, up nice and close, no? Yeah, thank you. I've been listening to what you've having to say, but I think that the prevention of suicide starts very much earlier in making sure that these people who feel the pain have a community in which they can express their depression, express their life problems. I belong to One Wave, which does saltwater therapy for people and brings people down to Bondi Beach and we talk about uh, openly get the people to come and talk how they feel and even when we had Prince Harry down on the beach he said his pain when he lost his mother was terrible because there wasn't a group of people who we could talk to and open up about the pain he was feeling. Now, One Wave today has over 200 groups worldwide offering um, saltwater therapy and group sessions once a week where people can come and feel the compassion of friends and have people who care about them. And I think that we've got to look at the beginning of the pain and not when a person becomes suicidal. They've got to feel that they belong to some organisation and that they're worthy of friendship and so forth. And that will prevent a lot of the suicide people. Thank, thank, thank you for that comment, Cedric. Uh, but I'll agree that uh, with this culturally diverse community that we have, we know that some cultures, religious or otherwise, will see that sort of uh, breakdown uh, in your interpersonal relationship uh, as being a negative, uh, something you can't do that's not manly. I mean, for Prince Harry being a prince, I'm sure, is most difficult. And the upper lip of the, uh, the Queen in many... Stories about that were certainly typical of not <laughs> wanting to be part of the pain. So I think that we know with uh, the young people down here, with, with Batir, in other words, giving people a chance to express what they're feeling is most important. So not, I guess you're saying support from the community, but in some ways our community is a bit got some problems as well, don't you think? Well, uh, I mean, we all used to... We all, well. I'm 50, right? But, you know, I lived with my grandmother for years. She knew everybody who lived in the street. They all knew her. You know, doors were open. All of those sorts of things used to happen. We've become less of one of those communities and that's fast-paced life there, all of these reasons. So 
congratulations on what you're doing because I'm sure it is making a massive difference and there is an epidemic of loneliness in, in our world. Um, you know, the UK government appointed its first Minister for Loneliness, which is a fascinating concept, but there are a lot of lonely people who have no one to talk to, no one in their life at all. They don't even know how to have the conversation to get into a group like yours. So, you know, groups like yours have to reach out and, and bring people in, but it does make a difference. Others would, of course, say we need to build resilience into people. So, I mean, I know when I'm not feeling well and something goes wrong, I can catastrophise things very quickly. I can tell you why everything's going to go wrong and be a disaster and that starts to push me towards suicidal thinking, right? So if I can be resilient, and this is why I'm blessed to be married to my wife, she will sort of push me up again and try and sort of get me on an even keel. If you don't have that person because you don't see people through the day and you live by yourself and your spouse is deceased or something or you're divorced and no family, on and on it goes, you're not going to have anyone to straighten that up and, and that's why the lifelines and others are of course important. But... There's no doubt building resilience early, making having social contacts and the like. It's not saltwater therapy, but at our surf club, I live up on the northern beaches. Yeah, the thing I love about surf clubs is you can be standing next to somebody who's worth ten million bucks, and you've got five bucks in your, your wallet, and that's it. So it's a great social leveler. The first thing is, and secondly, you sort of you're forced to look after each other because your kids are playing with other people's kids, and there's all this stuff happening. People are from different groupings and different cultures, and and so you end up looking after each other. It's, you know, we, we have a group that's just become looking after each other. You know, somebody's dad dies, everybody goes and helps and cooks meals. I and mean, it's very old-fashioned, really. But it works. It does make a difference for having people connected. So hopefully they don't get so far down the path. So I couldn't agree with you more. Okay, any other questions? Yes. Uh, lady down here. And uh, Danny, okay. And the young lady over there. Danny, please. Yep. Thank you. Um, Daniel Goldburn. Just stand up. <laughs> That's fine. Thank you. Um, as a person who's lost actually three first cousins to suicide, um, two from the same family, um, my auntie lost both her sons to suicide, um, all three of them were suffering from mental health. One was bipolar, one was schizophrenic. And I think the third cousin was simply just depression for over many, many years. Um, what's the connection between mental health and suicide? And secondly, how many people, is there any research on the number of people who commit suicide that don't have mental health? You obviously, you can't test the people who have succeeded, but the people who are actually uh, attempting suicide that aren't actually mentally ill. Yeah, look, that's uh, both great questions. So um, we, we, we know that um, mental illness is a significant risk factor for suicide. Um, but we also know that there are people who might have a diagnosis of depression or an anxiety disorder who don't think about suicide and who don't attempt suicide. So it's not the only factor. Um, and so things like social isolation come into play and other conditions that they might be experiencing. Um, and there are some protective things as well that the people might have in place, like family um, and good community support. Um, so they actually have done um, studies of people who've died by suicide, uh, and they call it a psychological autopsy. So they go through the medical records, they interview family members, and they try and do a diagnosis, I guess, um, retrospectively. Uh, so a significant peop uh, proportion of people who die by suicide will have had a, uh, will have had a, a mental illness. But um, it, the, the numbers depend on which studies you look at, but some studies would say it's you know, 20%, some would say it's less, some would say it's more, who don't have a diagnosis. Um, so, so yeah, we know that there are people and, and who, who wouldn't meet criteria for a mental illness, but they've gone through a particular crisis or uh, there's been some really significant triggers in their life which have, have meant that... Um, that they've taken their lives, but they may not have a mental illness. There is a level of um, hereditary mental illness. So if you have a, a parent with mental illness, there's a high chance you will have mental illness. The reverse of that, of, of that statement is also to say that uh, um, you don't have to have mental illness to take your own life. Um, mental illness, and I'm always worried with experts around me, so let me give it a go and they can clean up my mess, but 
you can live for a hundred years and have one moment of mental, uh, one moment of suicidality, one moment because something goes wrong, your business collapses, whatever, everything goes wrong for you, and you may never have that thought again. So it's that it can be that particular. Um, Alan always used to school me at Lifeline that the greatest single way to prevent suicide is to remove the means of suicide. So why do we have ugly, great uh, fences on bridges? For obvious reasons. The new metro rail line up the northwest of Sydney. This is an eastern suburbs crowd. There's a place when you go across the Harbour Bridge. Anyway, um, so that new northwest rail link up, up Castle Hill Way, they have those protective doors that open, open on the, the platform station before the train doors open, which are somewhat often called suicide doors to stop people from suiciding that way. So uh, we do remove the means a lot, but it, 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 it's simplistic possibly. Doctor, you might have a different view that might help here, but it can be an active impulse. You know, you can be completely balanced and people will often say after a suicide, I never thought there was anything wrong with them. You know, why didn't we... And often there wasn't anything wrong with them. It was just a whole set of events that, certain, that conspired at a certain time that may not have been predictable that sent that person down a path. Well, we also, if I can interject, the book The Tipping Point talked about one, one of the stories in The Tipping Point was in some of the islander society where young men, it was okay to suicide because the young chief's prince suicided because he couldn't marry the woman he wanted. So sometimes there's a cultural cause. Normalising. Normalising it, yes. Sorry, over to you, Michael. No, I was just going to say that um, that's absolutely true, that you know, restricting means of suicide is really vital and um, it can be quite crucial and people don't always appreciate that that's the case but but a lot of actions are impulsive they may be under the influence of drugs or alcohol um it buys time you know um and that's that's one of the reasons why it's so so important there's lots of studies that show it's you know one of the principal uh, planks in any good suicide prevention program um but there is some evidence for coming back to your question there is some evidence for the the hereditary aspect of suicidality which is independent of mental illness um so there is some some evidence kind of supporting that um and um and it's also true that um, that rates of um, psychiatric illness are higher in Western studies than they are in low and middle income countries, for what that's worth. Uh, the young lady there, yes, question, thank you. Hi. Um, John, one of the statistics you gave, which I thought was quite interesting, was that 7% of the calls that come in, you identify initially as a suicide call, and then during the uh, call, it goes up to 30%. So that's with people who are trained quite well to tease out those questions. So my question is actually to Michael, that bearing in mind we want to try and get in earlier, how does um, depression or suicide or the language young people use to express their feelings and emotions, is it quite different to what an adult might say. Does that sort of make sense? <laughs> yeah, look, the language can, I mean, the, the modality of communication can be quite different um, and, and that's important. But there are differences in, in the way that these problems present as well in um, adolescence, for example. Um, and there are some similarities, but, but uh, the ways they, they present can be quite different. Um, uh, for example, young men may kind of drive cars fast or they may present in courts rather than clinics. They may kind of, you know, do, do have a range of behavioural issues. That's one example. Um, uh, people may also present, for, you know, adolescents, for example, may present with school, you know, refusal or, you know, truancy or they may present with fatigue or you know headaches or you know range of somatic problems um there's a there's a range of proxies for for suicidal kind of um presentations that need to be identified um and uh you know exploration you know sometimes reveals that um so but yes, the, the language that, that, that's used, people, young people don't always come up front about this problem and, and it's, um, it's really important to kind of be patient and to try and establish a relationship and to try and um, work one's way through sometimes to a point where you're actually asking that question and, and it's like what John said earlier about the way you ask it. 
We find uh, also on that voice versus text, as an example, um, that uh, people take longer to tell you in, in a voice when they're talking. They can come up straight away on a text and tell you or on an online chat. Um, what, what we found that meant is we had to train our people slightly differently because they're used to this banter, for the want of a much better phrase, this very good, long, long-held, long trusted protocol. But if somebody just goes bang on a text or on a, on a message to you, it's quite confronting. So um, there's a significant change there. With young people as well, that, that I'm sure you've done this sort of research, but often the, you know, the terrible, you know, seven-year-old son has a screaming fight with mum or dad leaves the house and tries to take their own life. Many of those young men who don't complete those suicides will say, I really didn't want to die. I actually didn't want to die. So, which is a tragedy for those who do complete their suicides, but it's the, the, the lash out at that point in time. The other point I'd make, back to your point in the middle, I've forgotten that gentleman's name. Cedric. From Cedric. Is um, the greatest, there are two things that are coming, and I think this is Western world, Alan, in, in suicide. The first thing is we're seeing suicides now of kids under 10, not in large numbers, but we're seeing them start, so it's stretching. So kids under 10, which just blows the mind, of course. And um, the growth in suicide in those stats are men over 65. So, um, 80, 80, sorry? 85. 85. 85. Yeah, so men over 85 are increasing their suicide rate, which is a great sadness. I, now, I don't want to have a euthanasia debate around any of that, but it's a great sadness that you get to that point in your life and you don't, you know, you don't have family and friends or whatever to see you through. But... Um, so the growth isn't in youth suicide. We, youth suicide always grabs the headlines, and please don't think I'm diminishing that at all. But there's a, we're seeing growth in other parts of the age range when it comes to suicide that I don't think is getting the attention it deserves. I really don't. Well, I think that we know that a lot of car accidents of an older person are often a successful suicide. Yeah, sure. Sadly. We say complete suicide. We hate successful yeah, suicides. Yeah, well, yeah. Succeeded. <laughs> but bad word. Sorry. I'm going to ask Steph if I can, just we talk about the language. Do you think that the age of our mobile phone and apps is going to cause a problem in changing the language and issues around bullying causing potential for mm. suicide? Well, we, so we've had about 700 young people come through our program to learn how to share their stories and we definitely have had many young people talk about experiences of being bullied. And I think now with technology there is unfortunately, you know, cyberbullying that does occur where you know a young person might go home and that continues and there isn't where, where your home is meant to be your safe haven but I think that technology often gets quite a negative rap it can actually also be really positive and a protective factor as well where it can actually create connection in young people where young people have now this group of people that they can easily access and they can reach out and have conversations and I think even and and I think you would know more than me on this topic but even you know Facebook um, is starting to get even better at trying to recognize different words or work out how to connect people to maybe different kind of suicide hotlines in their community. Sarah would be um, great to speak to this as well, but I think it often is looked at in a negative way, but it can actually be a very positive tool for connection as well. Okay, thank you. So we're going to come down to religion. Do you think religion has maintained the taboo and we have a whole range of religions in Australia? We have an issue still with the churches and synagogues, etc., with regard to help help in suicide prevention. It, it's interesting. Um, I know he's obviously a controversial figure, but when George Pell was the Archbishop of Sydney, he wrote. He used to have a regular weekly article in the Sunday Telegraph, and he wrote an article and he said that the bishop, of one of the Catholic bishop of one of the Pacific Islands, where they had an increase in suicide, said he would not bury. So he would not bury kids who suicided in his churches yes. and it halved. Now, I don't know what you read into that. Other than that, my concern is, is the normalisation of suicide that we're seeing. That, um, you know, the one thing, we have to talk about it and we have to do something about it, but we should never glorify it, even by accident. That it's, it's a, it's a, I mean, I, I like to say um, I'd like us to choose life over death and there's no moral or religious judgment in that, but you're better alive than dead. We want you to live. We don't want you to die. Please choose life. In terms of religious groups, you, you, look, we've seen a massive change. You know, you're right. You, in your early days of practice, 
Catholics would get buried off. Well, they wouldn't get buried. They literally were not allowed to be buried out of the church if they were suicided. Many of the Christian religions that I know, the you know, Jewish faith would have looked negatively upon it. And So I think things have got a lot better. I think they have got a hell of a lot better. Um, and I've met police officers, well retired, who would tell me they'd attend the scene of a suicide and they'd yep. rearrange the body yep. so the death certificate would not say suicide. Right. Not for any other reason than the shame that it would bring the family. So I think we're getting better, that, better now and... Um, I think religions are doing better, better now. Um, to be broad, to be to be honest, in terms of the negative side of the way they view suicide, I can't speak to what they're doing to intervene and help. I mean, the obvious role for them to play is the role you know that Cedric spoke of earlier in terms of being a caring community. You know, no matter what's on the door, being a caring community that looks after people in times of difficulty. Problem for most churches is you know there's two men and a dog going every weekend. Um, and, that, and that's dropping at a rate of knots. So, yeah. so I'm less worried about the religious issues today than certainly 30 and 40 years ago. I don't know whether others have any views. I was just going to add that um, actually the research shows that being part of a religious community is a protective factor against suicide. And it probably is for all the reasons that Cedric mentioned. It's around that sense of belonging to something, that sense of purpose and meaning, which is really critical. And and sometimes when we talk to, I work clinically as well, and when I talk to clients about their reasons for, for living, um, it will be because they, it's, um, one of the reasons will be that it's against their religion to to die by suicide. So, you know, and that's, that is only a starting point. You don't want be, that to be the only thing that protects a person against, against killing themselves, but it's not a bad starting point and you can build on that. So, yeah. Uh, so I think if we can you know, reduce some of, the, some of the stigma about talking about our distress um, and talking about what actually are really fairly normal thoughts. When we look at the research, there's a really significant proportion of the population will at least think about suicide at some point in their life. So these are fairly normal thoughts. And if we think about how people reach that point, it's, as Alan said, it's psychic. People are feeling so distressed um, and when we're feeling so distressed, the reasoning part of our brain shuts down and we can't think of another way out. So our brain reaches for a way out. Um, and, it, and, you know, sitting here, we all know it's not the best way out. But at that point in time, for some people, it feels like it is. So I think in terms of religion, if we can frame it as something that we can talk about, um, but also use a religious community to provide that sense of belonging and meaning and purpose, then that's a really good thing to do. We, we see this as well um, in terms of the sense of belonging. The research was done maybe a year or two ago. You hear a lot about veteran suicide at the moment. Um, military personnel are less likely than the average to suicide when they're in the army and more uh, military, and more likely when they're out. So that family of uniform and discipline and activity and all of those things keeps it lower. So that's their that's their salt water therapy call. Well, they're in something. So being in something helps enormously. But you're right. I mean, I, when I was when I was suicidal. Yeah, 14 years ago, I, I convinced myself very quickly it was not only the, the the right thing to do but the best thing to do. You know, not the only thing but the best thing. And, you know, that's really odd thinking, right? That's really bizarre thinking but you can get yourself into that situation. And it's also my view that that's probably the only way you can rationally do what you're about to do because you've, you've settled yourself, you've worked out the answer to your problem and then you go off and calmly do it, for God's sake, which is pretty extraordinary. But you need to get pull people back from that minute. You know, you really do and... and um, um, you know, it breaks my heart and, and I'm glad to see you all here tonight and I, I'm thrilled Walpole's doing this because how can we live in a country that's so wealthy with so much opportunity and have suicide increasing? You know, with all the work we're doing, why is it going the wrong way? That's the... So, you know, the, the more of these we do, the better. But but we've got to arrest that slide. It's it's um, it's bad enough that it's... Um, it's bad... It was bad enough that it had flattened and wasn't going down. It's now going up. You know, I don't... And... and the, what is actually happening you know, in terms of... So, so one of the questions we came up with is, each one of you, is who do you think is that group of persons or people most risk of suicide in our national or, or the local community? Who, who do you feel are some of the people you feel are most at risk? I mean, we have a booming economy, but we also know that for some people, interest rates have gone down now. What if they go up? They'll get stretched financially. Um, big problem. So... Okay, so there's financially strapped person, but what? Who are the people that just pick one group that you feel we should consider at risk? Is anybody in particular? Young people being bullied—is that a particular group? Um, 
I don't, I, I don't know. I tend to try to sort of, if I was thinking about this uh, systematically, I'd think about <laughs> the, the universal thing and then particular groups and then I'd think about the, the very high pointy end. Um, so I'd go, go, you know, like, you know, at a, at a general level, you've got um, uh, particular groups that might, you know, sort of, well, men, for example, you know, um, men are much more likely to die by suicide than women. So, so there's something happening. So, there. if a young man so, or middle-aged man talks about, yeah, that's a, yeah, it's it's pretty consistent in 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 Western countries, but in non-Western countries, the ratio in Western countries it's about seventy-five percent or three to one, yes. um, and and in non-Western countries about one point five to one. So it's very different ratio and different stuff happening. So so you can have examples of you know universal phenomena. There is particular groups that are more at risk. For example, Indigenous people is a really good example in Australia, you know, who, are, who carry a, a huge burden of history and colonisation and so on. That, that so their uh, self-esteem, yeah, their self-worth. Ex exactly. Their and country being taken that's away from right. them. Um, people in rural areas, people of lower socioeconomic status, there's some evidence for that. Um, there's, there's a number of groups like that. The group I'd want to highlight from my perspective at a clinical end is people exiting psychiatric hospitals. They have they have such a high rate. If there's any group that's higher than pr pr previous suicide attempt, it's people leaving a psych hospital. Matthew Large's research has been absolutely conclusive about this recently, uh, 50 times greater than the general population. Um, and we just have to do a better job. You know, this is where I'm really passionate about following up people out of hospital or out of emergency departments. We don't do it well. There's, there is not a systematic way of doing it, and yet it really is where the the buck stops. Sorry, the thing is, we have practices in place for other people who live hospitals to be looked after. It's not like we have to, we don't have to invent the wheel here. We have other well, well tried, well um, used and very successful follow up methods for other people who live with a broken leg or anything with broken leg to a baby. But if you're mentally ill, you get waved out the door. And I can tell you, having spent time in a clinic, um, it's great to be in the clinic because you get looked after, everything's cocooned, a lot of the pressures are taken away. Then you walk back into the wide world and that hits you like a, uh, you know, hits you in the face. And I found it very distressing my first couple of days outside a clinic, very distressing, despite the fact that I had a loving wife and family and friends and a home to live in and all of the stuff many people don't. If there's one public policy thing I'd push for too, it's the follow-up care for people there because we will, we, I think that's where we'll begin to make a serious difference. Thank you. So, Fiona, thinking about that question, anything to add? About who's at risk? Yeah, who's besides yeah. that particular group, yeah. generally? Yeah, um, look, I, I think I, I share Michael's views that, that it's difficult to pinpoint a, a group um, because the reality is it's, it's a, a shared risk across a whole, a whole bunch of people, really. Um, and, you know, so I think we can talk about risk factors and risk groups, but actually pinpointing a particular person who is at risk is much more difficult uh, and indeed impossible. We know clinical, it's quite difficult to, to identify who is the person who's going to attempt suicide. So what we need to do is to make sure we've got all those protocols in place that people who, who anyone who is at risk actually receives the care that they need. Um, so, so over to Alan, then we go to the rural setting. So we that's a risk group, in other words, is it? Oh, yeah. look, look, it, it is. Um, you got inside there. I, I guess I uh, w would have to sh build on the comments for several people already and just to reinforce that the, the person who is, who is most vulnerable to dying by suicide is the person who's already experienced crisis and maybe attempted to end their life. So you know, we have to... You know, name suicidality as something that we respond to and recognise and have effective responses that will will engage with it with a person, um, and that will cut across a whole whole range of backgrounds. It's it's. Um, I, I would say one other thing, and it does touch a little into, I guess, the rural perspective, um, and, and that is. Those people in our society who feel left out and excluded, uh, uh, you know, that, 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 that's an issue around uh, suicide because um, human beings need to feel 
that they belong and are connected. And, yeah, this might be one of the challenges uh, for Australian society in a very modern, fast-paced world with a lot of change going on, uh, is that there can be people who get left out. And we need to be a bit careful as a society that we don't um, encourage people to be left out, you know, to create divisions and segmentation of our society. Uh, so, you know, some of the things that we can positively do is create an inclusive, uh, broadly accepting society. And Australia's done that very well in parts so of its far. history. You know, we, we can do it. Except that we're leaving out our native Australians sometimes. <laughs> that, and, yeah, I think that's that's got to be one of the things that Australia as a nation has to address. And we see the enormous tragedy of uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander suicide. Yep. Uh, and the question that, that I think has to be asked there is what is it that is making... Um, ending one's life more attractive than living one's life. Now, there are lots of analytical things and data that you can come at it, but at the end of the day, what shifts a person from feeling that it is better to die than to live? Thank you. So, Claire, something else to add there? Anything you'd like to add to that? Um, they talk about see, ask, listen and tell. That's one of the things we talk about in suicide prevention training. To see, I think, is what we're attempting to do tonight and going forward, is actually raising people's awareness that for many people in the community, they are thinking about suicide as an option. So I think seeing it and being aware of it is, you can then follow through with the ask, listen and tell. Um, I think the Jewish community is ideally placed for this uh, creating that safety net because there is a lot of social connection. Um, there are a lot of groups, a lot of communities of interest occurring. So I think we can be good at reaching out to people and giving them that safety net if we can at least acknowledge that tough times happen um, to everybody and that there's uh, a way through it. So I'm feeling very positive that I think um, there's a lot of caring in the community. It's about getting it to the right place at the right time. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the, the audience? Up the back. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, good evening. Uh, <coughs> it's very interesting. I've been listening to, obviously, what everybody's been saying, but... Um, there is a solution to all this. I've uh, lived through it myself, through anxiety, and I've gotten out of it, through doing a lot of work on myself. And you come to discover that the biggest enemy in your life is yourself. It's your subconscious. And your life starts at the time of conception. And from the time of conception, even as a fetus already, you're getting your mother's vibration. We, we like to hear comments, but can you have a question, please? Uh, we don't understand. No, I don't have a, I don't have a question. Uh, that's okay. I can, I can you know, stop here. But there is a way out. That's all. Thank you. I, I, where I... I think I understand what you're saying is you do have to take control of your own life. Um, Be closer. Uh, and there are lots of th there are lots of things we do in our lives, almost by rote courtesy and and the like. And I have learned to take myself out of situations I know that stress me, and that that is often hard to do, right? Because you're meant to do that thing, you're meant to go to that family event, but you know there, there's a reason why you know. Christian families only get together in many cases one day a year, which is Christmas dates, because they don't like each other for every other day of the year, um, and and they don't. You know, it sounds absurd, but we put ourselves in so many social situations we shouldn't put ourselves in that make us upset and stressed. And I just learned to say no to some of that stuff, and I'm the better for it. <laughs> um, 
we do put our, I, I don't know about you, but we just learn, we learn to, we get forced into situations, you know. I was going to say that I think you're right in terms of the comment about it being developmental. I think that suicide has an aspect that is a lifelong kind of, has a li lifelong trajectory to it. But I also wanted to pick up on what Alan was saying a moment ago and about the, the issue of um, uh, the increased you know, gap you know, in our society, in caring in a way, I guess the gap between rich and poor um, and and widening, you know, tr widening problems in that respect. And I was thinking about trauma and I was thinking about the fact that, you know, um, one of the key risks for, for suicidality is abuse, adversity, stress of various kinds, including financial stress, you know, life events type stress. These are things that do really impact massively. And one of the key groups that we have through emergency departments these days is people, certainly people with depression, but people with personality issues. And these are people who have problems with emotion regulation, they have suicidality, self-harm, and they've often been stigmatised and they have, you know, they have traumatic histories. They're often, you know, um, I guess victims of socioeconomic processes, you know, that that overtake, you know, their lives, the lives of their families. They they struggle to survive, and and to get through is is an everyday challenge in a major way. And I think to to actually address the needs of that population, and there, there is a you know, New South Wales government initiative in this regard, which has been, you know, I think had good runs on the board, but it's been a, it's been a very, very important area in terms of understanding the needs in, in, in this particular area, linking the issue of trauma and, you know, personality and a number of things like that. Just uh, the nice young lady down the front here, Mrs Dudley. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is a question for Michael, actually, I, I guess, but the rest of the panel's also welcome, of course, to uh, respond. Uh, this is a question about... Um, antidepressants and suicide and there have been some concerns I think at times raised about that link. Yeah that's certainly true. Um, they have come up for a lot of um, uh, mention um, and um, there was a there was a real controversy about a dozen years ago particularly related to young people about antidepressants and whether they were a effective and b safe um, and um, I guess that there was a huge amount of literature that was collected in a compulsory fashion for the US Federal Food and Drug Administration and also a similar process in the UK and Australia which looked at the data very, very closely and amalgamated a lot of studies to do with about four or 5,000 adolescents and found that there was there was a signal for for suicidality in 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 that group. So people who had the active product rather than placebo um, were more likely to be suicidal, starting antidepressants. So there was a signal, but this was for all indications, or in other words, all the all the diagnoses that were made and and all the different drugs. This is an amalgamated. Signal, signal, which disappeared when um, you took, you know, when you disaggregated the data. There's a lot of evidence, though, with antidepressants from other studies that that at a population level, prescribing correlated with lowering suicide rates. That's that's an association, not causation, but it was fairly strong sort of evidence. And we did some research a few years ago that looked at. Uh, that looked at all the studies that had studied young people who died by suicide and found that in terms of the toxicology, um, only about 1.5% were actually taking antidepressants when they died by suicide. So in other words, it's not the antidepressants that kill people, it's, some, it's that they're not being treated. Um, so very important issue. Um, th th these drugs can have an activating effect when people start them, particularly young people, and it can be seen in young adults as well, particularly. Um, but um, in general, that, that disappears. If, it, if it's a problem, then it's important to warn people for it, so, uh, indicate that it should be monitored and, and, and basically lower the dose or change the drug. But antidepressants are incredibly important. For, for kind of um, for addressing um, 
for addressing suicide and that they have a very vital role, I think, in, in general practice and many other cases to do with addressing depression, anxiety, OCD and stuff like that. There are some other drugs, for example, lithium has a very strong pedigree for, for anti-suicidal effects and it ought to be probably be used much more widely in terms of preventing suicide for people with a number of indications that could qualify for prescribing lithium. Okay, so I think... Uh Mindful that it's nine o'clock and we actually get thrown into the theatre at 9.15 with a movie. <laughs> so before the movie starts, I just want you to say thank you to our panel here and to our guest. Thank you. Thank you to uh, Walper Hospital and to Claire Vernon and Jewish Care. And please know that you've been provided with a very good support services pamphlet here. Please consider that. We also like to have feedback from you. There's a feedback form there. If you're not on our list uh, to be up to date with our regular events, the next one is September, I think Wednesday the 4th of September, which is on osteoporosis and arthritis, another chronic disease in the community that's not going away. Uh, we'd lovely, love to have you here and to say thank you all for coming out tonight and I hope that it's helped um, in suicide prevention and helped you personally. So thank you very much. Before, Over to Josephine. Before you exit, I'd just like to, on behalf of the Board of Walpart, take a moment to really thank Alan. Um, I know that with his style and grace and the special way that he did his hair tonight, it's been hard to spot the gap with Julie not able to make it. Um, but it's a big thing to take on this evening, but it's such an important topic and I know that Dr Shell desperately didn't want to let everyone down. So I'd just like to really thank him for stepping in at the last minute tonight. It's a big job and you did it with such grace. So thank you so much. Thank you. That was all. Thank you. Thank you and have a good evening and we hope to see you again. Good night. <laughs>